everyone. Welcome to St. Louis County Library's virtual program, Investing in Native Trees and Shrubs, presented by Meredith McAvoy Perkins of Forest Relief of Missouri, as part of the Partners for Native Landscaping webinar series. I'm Sarah Jones, Adult Programming Coordinator for St. Louis County Library. Before we get started, I wanted to bring to your attention a few helpful tips about a Zoom webinar so that if it's your first uh, time with us, or you could use a refresher, you'll have those tips. So this is a webinar, which means you should be able to uh, see and hear us, but we cannot see or hear you. Uh, we are recording, so this will be available on our YouTube page within a few days. You'll receive an email link um, when, an email with the link when we've posted it to YouTube. Uh, we also have subtitles available now, so you can uh, adjust those by going to the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And uh, you can hide or show the subtitles or adjust the size of the font by going to the subtitle settings. Also, we are um, uh, going to be able to take questions at the, um, those will be answered at the end, but feel free to drop them in the chat as they occur to you throughout the evening. Finally, if you have any issues with your connection this evening, feel free to leave the uh, webinar and get closer to your Wi-Fi router and rejoin us. That generally um, does, does the, has the most impact in improving um, any connectivity issues you might have. So those are the webinar tips. So then I just wanna remind you a few things about programs with St. Louis County Library. Um, Remember, please, that you don't have to have a library card or even be a resident of St. Louis County to attend our virtual programs. Our hope is that you enjoy yourself or learn something new this evening and you share it with your family and friends and let them know that we have other great programs coming up or they can check this one out on YouTube. Today's program is a part of the Partners for Native Landscaping series and the next couple of programs in that webinar series are uh, next Tuesday, March 29th at 2 p.m. We have uh, Garden Maintenance for Wildlife, A New Way to Garden, presented by Scott Woodbury of the Shaw Nature Reserve. And then Wednesday at 7 p.m. next week on the 30th, we have Rainscaping with Native Plants, presented by Allison Joyce of the Missouri Botanical Garden and Cody Hayo of Pretty City Gardens and Landscapes. Uh, you can register for these and the other programs in this series, which run through April 6th or any SLCL program by going to www.slcl.org slash events. And also don't forget, you can catch up on most any program, including all of the Partners for Native Landscaping programs, um, any of those that you might miss by checking out the library's YouTube channel. I'm gonna have links to all of those things in the chat once we get underway, um, as well as a survey to provide the Partners for Native Landscaping some feedback about today's webinar. So we appreciate it if you take time to respond to that. Now I'd like to introduce you to this evening's presenter, Meredith McAvoy Perkins. She is a passionate conservationist, forester and arborist who has dedicated her 20 year career to connecting people to the benefits of trees. After working in state government and private urban forestry, consulting across the country, Meredith is the executive director with Forest Relief of Missouri, a nonprofit organization that aligns with her values and allows her to help her home state of Missouri grow. Thank you for being with us, Meredith, as a part of the Partners for Native Landscaping webinar series. We're so happy to have you with us. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm delighted to be here. It's a nice rainy spring day. And although many of us are kind of cuddled up in our houses, the trees are loving it. So yeah. can't complain. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, right? Yep, perfect. Okay, we're ready to rock and roll. All right, well, good evening to all of you. I am um, just really excited to be part of this series. I don't know how much you have gone through the program so far, but looking at the lineup that Sarah just mentioned and knowing a lot of those presenters, I hope that you stick with it because there's a lot of knowledge in that, um, in that list. So there's a lot of good information. And today we're really gonna be focusing on native trees and shrubs pre-planting for a resilient future. So we'll kind of break down what that is and um, and where we're going with it. My hope is really for you to walk away with some nuggets, talking about different trees and different options um, so that you can really build your confidence when you're investing in native trees and shrubs. I am biased for good reason. 
Um, and I think trees and shrubs are awesome, mostly trees, but I recognize that you might not be. So I want to start with a few answers to questions that I would have if I was sitting through this conversation. Let me make sure I can. Okay, here we go. So why listen to me? Sarah gave a nice bio on my background. I have certification. You know, I'm an arborist. I have a degree in forestry. I'm a dedicated conservationist. I have all this experience. But more importantly, I have a passion for connecting people really with nature. And I have this personal curiosity. So I'm coming at it from a place of science, but also from a place of really um, realities. Um, I live in the city. I love exploring our native forests. I have a vested interest in protecting our planet for my kids and future generations. Um, so there's all these different things that weigh on me when I think about trees and why trees. I have a soft spot for all trees. So even the occasional ginkgo and Freeman maple that you see in the picture here behind me, that when they match my jacket and scarf, I really can't not love them. Um, don't tell my forestry friends. But Really, as much as I delight in the beauty and the wonder of trees, I recognize that planting and stewarding them is actually a really big responsibility. So that's what we're going to dive into today. And hopefully you can feel empowered um, and ready to take on that responsibility yourself. Okay, so why should picking a tree be taken so seriously? All growing up, my family was really interested in picking trees because they were prettier, because we liked them. Um, but in this picture, this is my son many years ago, climbing in a bristlecone pine in Great Basin National Park. So Great Basin is home to some of the oldest living things on earth. This tree is estimated to be just shy of 5,000 years old. So trees can stick around for a really long time, especially if we do our part to take care of them. So it's really critical that we think critically about this investment that we're making in the immediate benefits and the long-term future impact. So there are so many ways, you know, there's so many ways that we can make a difference in our landscape. We can connect with nature. We can beautify your yard. You're going to learn a lot about those through this series. I'm sure you have a lot of those things in your personal interests, but very few as lasting as planting a tree. So planting a tree really is leaving a legacy and you can have compounding interest over time with that tree as it grows, it grows benefits like no other really. So we kind of want to do it right. And it feels like a lot of kind of a burden out in the front end if you actually think about it. My goal is to really talk you through what, what kinds of things you want to think about and help you make that decision. Um, and I won't probably end up making the decision for you, um, but hopefully I'll empower you to do that um, so that you can improve your personal landscape and also your community, both your human community and your ecological community. Okay. So this slide could really be a lecture in itself. It, it often is. Much of my job is preaching to why we want trees in our landscape, what tree, the value and benefits of trees are, research continues to support the fact that trees are essential. They're an essential part of our ecosystem that we can't take for granted. Trees are important for our health. For example, Forest Service researcher Jeffrey Donovan, one of my favorite researchers actually, has shown that trees in cities clean and remove particulate matter and other toxins that cause upper respiratory diseases, including one of the ones that is a major problem for us here in the region, asthma. Also, healthy tree canopy can connect, healthy tree canopy can really connect to improved health outcomes, including increased birth weights for babies and newborns, active lifestyles. Health is a big emerging um, focus for trees in particular, but we're seeing correlation, 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 um, connecting healthy landscapes with healthy people. Trees are also really important for our environment. We learn that when we are young and in school, the trees provide oxygen, but you know, the, the environment is so much deeper than that. I think the keynote speaker, if you had the privilege of listening to Doug Tallamy earlier on in this series, he mentions that one oak tree is a primary host for over 900 caterpillars. That's unreal. Those 900 caterpillars are then 
having caterpillar babies and feeding all kinds of the birds and things that we love to see um, and supporting a greater ecosystem. So trees are supporting our environment in ways that we don't even often even notice or pay attention to. They're also fighting back climate change and rooting down our riverbanks. Lots of environmental benefits. Um, trees are important to our economy. This is one that we talk about a lot in urban forestry because sometimes just a tree because it's amazing isn't enough of an excuse to plant um, in the limited real estate in an urban landscape. But if we can talk dollars and cents, that's something that resonates. So there's all of these things that are now emerging about how trees are kind of supporting the bottom line. Did you know people will travel farther, stay longer, and spend more money in business districts with healthy trees? That's that's pretty impressive. And if you think about your own personal habits and where you spend your money and where you go, and where you enjoy having a cup of coffee, um, it resonates usually. And that makes sense. Um, also, shade from trees lowers energy costs in the summer. So we're paying less out of pocket for those air conditioning bills. Um, this is a big, a big boost to our personal economy. Um, and then lastly, on this slide, trees are really important for community. As we start growing, the you know connecting with people around us, we we have that experience in trees. Trees invite hikes and picnics and neighborhood conversations. They're minimizing that urban heat island in our neighborhoods and our cities, and they're maximizing things like porch swinging time. Um, and that you know, the more people sitting on their their porches, the more community happens. Um, so I did put a link here, vibrantcitieslab.com. There's a lot of great in-depth information about the value and benefits of trees, good site, um, good different uh, case studies and different things about, about trees. So if you're really curious about that, um, you know, check that out or stay tuned for some more forest relief stuff. We'll, I'm sure we'll be talking more about it. This is another image, um, it's from the Nature Conservancy, and it breaks down the benefits of urban trees in particular. As you explore your gardening with native trees and shrubs, knowing that these leafy green oxygen machines are providing more than just you know, something pretty that, that you like to look at um, can, can be powerful. Things like filtering particulates, cooling, you know, cooling the city, reducing, cardiovascular disease, improving public health, protecting biodiversity. As we start digging deeper into natives in particular, um, the biodiversity provided by the tree or the urban forest in, um, is really significant. Um, reducing obesity levels, getting people outside moving, managing, oops, I'm blocked with my picture here, I can't see it. Managing storm water. Um, you know, I think I, there were some things on the slide with the uh, with the stormwater programs that St. Louis and MSD are offering. Trees are part of that green infrastructure, increasing neighborhood property values. And, and really this one down in the corner is something that we haven't had a lot of really detailed um, data on when I was the beginnings of my career, maybe 20 years ago, but now more than ever, we're seeing the stress reduction and the focus around people who are in green spaces versus people that aren't. Um, and nothing, it was it was most clear the last couple of years as we all struggled through the pandemic with kind of our near nature being our respite and our escape from our, our quarantine. So as I mentioned at the beginning, I'll really be focusing on native trees and shrubs for this talk. And I just wanted to review and clarify what native means in the context of plants. So native plants originally are originally occurring within the region as a result of natural process, excuse me, natural processes and is adapted to the local climate and soils. Native plants have co-evolved with native insects and wildlife and are critical to ecosystem functions. So basically native trees is a filter for trees and shrubs that are well suited to grow in our area and will support the critters that rely on them. That's kind of the gist of it. This doesn't mean that all native trees are bad. It or sorry, all non-native trees are bad. It just means that a native tree might be a better option. Um, so keep in mind that 
I, I'm, I'm not here to tell you to cut down the Japanese maple that you love that's next to your front porch or not to plant that apple tree in your garden. You know, find joy in placing trees in your landscape that give you joy. But, you know, I think that what we'll, you'll find is that there's a lot of really cool native trees. Um, and if you give them a chance, they'll probably impress you. And sometimes it's just a matter of not knowing what's out there. So we're gonna talk about it a little bit. We are lucky here in Missouri to have amazing native trees and shrubs. We, I worked previously, I'm from St. Louis originally, but I spent about 10 years in Salt Lake City in Utah and they really just don't have a lot of great native trees that you can plant in your yard. There's some trees in the mountains that you can plant, but really not too much growth in the desert. And it was a really difficult place to promote planting native trees because really it was a desert. Um, but here in Missouri, we have so many options to choose from. This list of 70 species, trees and woody shrubs is really just a start to what's out there. Missouri has 22 species of oaks alone. That's a lot. And it's hard to tell them apart sometimes. If you're interested in identifying oak trees, the Missouri Department of Conservation has a really slick little magazine that's oaks and hickories and it's got great pictures and it's got great um, images of acorns and leaves to identify all those 22 different types of oaks and kind of identify where they are located within the Missouri geography. But anyway, of all of these, it doesn't mean that all 70 species listed here are right for your project or that the tree or shrub you know that you land on is even available in the nursery. One of the biggest challenges is a lot of these trees aren't, aren't grown um, for the nursery trade. And so they can be really hard to get your hands on to put into your personal garden or landscape. For example, we have so many great oak options, but you know, there's only a handful that are, that are pushed through and propagated to be, you know, that you'll find at your garden center. Um, I won't read off this whole list, but if you're interested, in this, take a screenshot of it or just think about it. Or if you're kind of plant curious, um, you know, find a few, put your pinpoint down, put your pen on some and, and look up a few of these different trees that, that you may never have heard of before. Um, I think you'll be surprised at how interesting some of them are. Um, a nice place that you can vet a lot of this information. I will go through, I'm gonna be going through a lot of tree species. Um, and I'm just going to keep it simple with the common names. But when you're, if you, if you're taking notes, or you're kind of thinking about what might work for your needs. Um, you can vet a lot of these, these trees and their specific site characteristics, um, botanical characteristics at the Missouri Botanical Garden Plant Finder site. Um, so that's a really great resource. I'm sure many of you are aware of that already. But the Missouri Botanical Garden Plant Finder has really just good specifications and pictures. Um, but once you start Googling all of these things, the other thing I would mention is to use the word Missouri in the search. So if you were, if you were searching, you know, Baroque Missouri, you're gonna get pictures and links that, that are more regionally um, appropriate. So, all right. So with many of those options to choose from, why would we commit to one whole street covered with one particular species. Um, I don't know if this site looks familiar to many of you in the St. Louis metropolitan region, but um, this is a street that has suffered from emerald ash borer and those are the remaining stumps of the tree canopy that was removed um, along that corridor. And it is heartbreaking and it is the cause of a monoculture of planting. So if you look at that list that I put up there before, I highlighted maybe the top, top 10, and this was not scientific, this was just me you know, making some, some notes, but um, you know, that are, that are pretty popular and readily available in the landscape. The problem with providing kind of recommended lists, especially to people, you know, who are just curious and want to know, you know, what's the best tree for me? I always get that question. What's, what tree should I plant in my yard? And, you know, if we are always telling people this handful of, a, you know, a dozen or so trees, then we end up getting into a point where we're all planting the same tree. 
And when we're all planting the same tree or we're planting them in a row, then the tr then the, the landscape becomes very vulnerable to any kind of negative impacts. So, you know, there's a lot of good options and planting too many of the same species, even if they're natives can cause issues. Massive devastation from insects like the emerald ash borer. Um, go back to the American chestnut, to the American elm, and now the ash trees. So, you know, this image is from ash trees that were removed, but imagine if we had a critter that was coming and eating our maples. Um, you know, that, that'll make a big impact. Uh, the answer to this conundrum is really diversity. If we can continue to promote and celebrate all the different native species that we have and incorporate a lot of them into our landscape, we're getting to that resilient aspect of the title of this talk. The more diverse our, for our forest system can, is, the more resilient it can be at um, fighting off a lot of these other you know, insects and diseases. And if we can't, if the trees can't fight them off, at least we're only losing a small portion of the canopy in the long run. Okay, so before embarking on a planting project in your garden landscape, it's important to consider what you're planting for. This seems like a really simple thing, but it is something that often gets overlooked when we're you know, going to the garden center and we're tasked with getting a tree and we just kind of browse. You know, it's kind of like going to the grocery store without a list and then you come home with, <clears throat> you know, cupcakes and crab sticks and you're like, I don't know what happened there. Um, so choosing a native tree or a shrub offers a lot of, hopefully a lot of checks to these different purposes, but, but you wanna know what you're in for and what you're looking for when you start thinking about planting. So is this a natural area that you're restoring? A lot of the work that we do with Forest Relief is providing native trees and shrubs for natural areas. Um, that might be invasive species replacement like honeysuckle replacement, or it might be planting trees along the Katy Trail that have been removed over the years. Um, so, so in those cases, we really want to look at what historically was there, what do we want to put back there, and how can we kind of make it as close to na natural as, uh, as it can be? What, what is already growing there and how can we support and bolster that? Um, maybe you want to increase your environmental benefits for non-humans. Some of the plantings that are so refreshing in the St. Louis County area and beyond is this back to, back to nature focus where we're not just planting for ourselves, but really thinking about those environmental ecosystem services the trees can provide for the birds and the bees and the butterflies, um, you know, and, and, and more. So do we want to plant these trees because we want to feed Birds. Do we want to plant these trees because we want to support, um, you know, different kinds of kinds of wildlife? Um, so that's going to drive some of your choices. Do we want to increase environmental benefits for humans? Right. That's if if you're like, okay, this is my house and I've got one space for one tree, it's got to be working for me. I need I need to cool my house so my air conditioning bills in July are reduced or. You know, I want to make sure that I'm buffering particulate matter because I am adjacent to a highway. Um, or I want to encourage my kids to go outside and play in the backyard and, you know, have more, have improved health outcomes. Those are also questions that, that don't seem directly related to tree selection, but really do help narrow the, narrow the selection process and narrow your, um, your opportunity. So, so maybe you want a big shade tree to you know, check that box. Maybe you want um, a beautiful flowering tree because your purpose is beautification. Um, you know, do you want to define an area? Do you want to offset? You know, set your um, a, a buffer between your neighbors. These are all different kinds of purposes that that you want to think through and kind of have a good a good answer for before you go and start really looking and falling in love with a tree. Okay, so the mantra right tree, right place 
has been coined by the utility industry for I don't know how long, decades. And, and it was a really important conversation. It was a really important um, education piece for the utility companies that said, hey, put the right tree under the power lines because you also want safe, reliable power and we don't want those trees growing into it. Um, they, now the tree community really uses this phrase for much more than just power line awareness. We're talking about, you know, thinking through all of those purposes and then coming out with the right tree that you've decided and then making sure that it fits the space that you've defined for it, that you have available um, and everything kind of comes out. So, you know, the there's a lot to consider and I think really breaking it down into these what is that four different categories is probably the best one so they're the best way to kind of break it down um so i wanted to just go through a hypothetical situation with this this image that i took on my walk yesterday um so consider your planting purpose so we will say that years ago this is maybe a 15 year old um tree we'll say years ago the purpose was to fill the sidewalk cutout with something pretty your purpose does not have to be earth shattering. It can just be something that simple. I want to put something pretty there because there's an, a vacant sidewalk cut out and it's supposed to have a tree. So then we want to consider the site. I'm like, okay, what is this site actually? It's about two feet by two feet on the street. It's got limited soil volume. There's overhead power lines. There's cars, there's pedestrian conflicts. It's out, out in full sun. These are the things we know about the site. Every site's going to have different kind of issues but defining that knowing okay got it and so then we think okay great i really i went out to the garden center it was the end of march and all of these beautiful trees were flowering white fell in love with them i have to have it plus my neighbor has one too so i'm going to plant a bradford pear public service announcement please don't plant bradford pears we'll talk about that in a minute but for this, we'll say, great, that's what they decided. Um, and what do we know about a Bradford pear tree? It gets about 50 foot tall. It can be up to 18 inches in trunk diameter. Some pros, it has a white spring flower, showy fall color, kind of glossy green leaves, really tolerant of urban soils. Those are all, they seem pretty good. But then when you balance that out with the cons, it starts to get a little bit unbalanced. Well, it has weak branch unions. The flowers smell a little funky. And oh, by the way, it's a terrible invasive species. Okay, so now we know the pros and the cons. We have to consider what the impact of that tree is in the landscape. So as you start putting it all together, you think, well, okay, now this tree is probably gonna grow too large for the site and lift the sidewalk. It's gonna have a conflict with the power lines, you know, once it's mature. So that, that's kind of a negative impact. The branches could fall on cars or people when they break apart in storms. Um, and by having this in my landscape, it's going to perpetuate the invasive species problem overall. You know, when you talk yourself through that whole process, it really makes the decision for you. So in this particular case, I would urge you to think of a native alternative. So instead of an invasive calorie pear, cultivar, Bradford pear, consider a downy service berry. So this is a similar, a similar um, situation, a small sidewalk cutout. This is the tree in, uh, you know, in flower in the spring and as a single stem kind of early fall color, downy service berry. So this tree service berry maxes out at 25 foot tall. The flower still smells, it smells nice, it's still pretty, has low risk of failure, and bonus, it has edible berries for birds and for people. So you still get, you still accomplish the purpose of a pretty tree that fills a hole, but you don't have that negative impact. Instead, you alter that with some positives. Um, so finding the right tree can take a little time and the nursery industry doesn't always make it easy, but, but you have to be persistent as you work through those questions and, uh, and nail down exactly what's gonna be your magic situation. Um, the garden centers, so I, I have a really special place in my heart for garden centers and find myself 
loving to just walk around. It's like, it's like some people like to walk through bakeries or even department stores. I love to walk through garden centers. So, um, so this is not a slam at them, but one of the things that, that is obvious and is that when things are blooming, they're really tempting. So garden centers are exploding right now with trees and shrubs that tempt you with gorgeous spring blossoms and lush foliage. We've got purple leaf plum. We've got our all of the saucer magnolias and things that are just spectacular right now. Evergreen trees, if you look at most of our native trees and shrubs right now, just look like ugly little sticks. But if you have just, you know, get inspired by this, by this talk, you go to the garden center, you're gonna see a lot of things that are really showy right now. But that, that's kind of, um, you know, it sometimes can get in the way for making a good choice. So don't, you know, don't sell out because something looks pretty right now. And remember that you have four seasons uh, to enjoy this plant. If you go in the summer, you might be drawn to full canopy, really green leaves, interesting leaf shapes, different purple colors, Japanese maples. Um, if you go in the fall, you're going to be eager to purchase those autumn brilliance native our service berries or the freeman maples that were in that picture at the beginning um so wait for what you want and sometimes if you go through that process and you kind of have your your list the the nursery manager might say hey yeah we're not going to have any of those until we're not going to have wildfire black gums until the fall because that's when they look pretty and that's when we can sell them so sometimes you might have to wait it out um to get to get the trees that you want. So I wanna go through a few alternatives. I'm gonna kind of um, kind of throw out some issues and then I'll throw out some, some native suggestions. And again, just a reminder that I'm gonna give you a couple of characteristics about these trees, but um, by no means is this a comprehensive uh, information about each of these. So if, if it sparks your interest or your curiosity, please, please look them up. Um, flowering natives to consider everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people that reach out to Forest Relief are really looking for what's a nice smallish flowering tree that I can put in my garden. Um, I only have a small city lot or I only have a you know, town home or something, but I'd like to plant a native and I'd like it to have pretty flowers, not too big. Um, and so we really, we have a tree for that. Redbud tree is really, I would say, a darling of the native forest. It is the tree here with the purpley, really small flowers. It blooms. It'll be blooming here in another couple of weeks. Um, and just a striking tree in the native forest while you're going hiking and just really strong urban performer. It you know, they tend to root quite well and, uh, and really take off. I planted some seedlings from that my kids brought home from an Arbor Day event a couple of years ago. And man, those things went through a lot and they're doing great in the backyard. So that's a really, it's a really good tree that you can kind of sneak into your garden um, in a lot of different places. Uh, another great tree is a service berry. We talked about that a little bit and I had that picture on the other slide. So I didn't include the flower here, but I did include the fall color um, because the service berry has a lot of seasons of interest, the flower, the fruit, and then also this nice uh, orangey fall color. So that's another really small tree slash woody shrub that uh, that can check a lot of boxes for people in their garden. And it also is great for a um, native food forest opportunity. So um, we're seeing that emerging as a really popular tree. It can come in a single stem version like the one in the other picture, or often commonly a multi-stem, more of a bushy, kind of a large shrub. Fringe tree is one that I personally love. I think, hopefully you can see my cursor here, but um, fringe tree has a really pretty white flower, really showy, fringy white flower. It kind of got out of favor for a while because there were some concerns that because it's in the same family, as ash, Fraxinus, um, that there may be some overlap with the emerald ash borer. And emerald ash borer has nibbled on fringe tree, um, but the reality is the state entomologist is still encouraging planting the tree and it's a really wonderful option. There's some great specimens at the botanical garden um, and just a really kind of an interesting 
piece for your, you know, a more, a less common tree for your home landscape. Um, another one that I love, it's a larger, a larger flowering tree is yellow wood. It has a, a really, these panicles of flowers are these white flowers that are drooping down here. And the bark is really smooth. It ends up kind of getting smooth and wrinkly like an elephant foot. Um, so it's a, it's a great, I've actually seen a number of these starting to get planted in city and county parks. So yellow wood would be one if you wanted a larger medium size shade tree that flowers um, because the reality is flowering trees in Missouri are a bit rare. Um, the last one that I'd like to point out for you today is called a gray dogwood. So everybody knows a flowering dogwood. It is definitely at, you know, our state, our state symbol and something that is just really striking and beautiful. Um, but, and, and it is native. So flowering dogwood is a great choice for a number of reasons, but it is, it is a little bit tricky to grow in some of our home gardens, home landscapes, because the soil isn't as ideal as it would be in other, in its natural form. So sometimes you don't have success with a flowering dogwood. A gray dogwood is a little bit more, oh, maybe a little wilder in habit as it grows. You can prune it to be um, more formal if you'd like. It has a different kind of a flower. It has more of a flower cluster there, but it is really a great underutilized tree that can grow in a lot of different sites. So versatile flowering tree that would be a nice one um, to consider in your home landscape. All right, when we think about fall, we're kind of skipping forward. These are all the, the, the things that people say my purpose or my interest is I really want spring flowers or I really want fall color. And then the first thing out of pretty much anybody's mouth is I think I want a maple tree because maple trees are beautiful in the fall. They are magical and I can't help myself standing and you know taking selfies and laying in the leaves and all of that. Um, but the problem is back to the comment I mentioned before is that there's so many of them in the landscape that it can be, you know, it can be vulnerable um, for all kinds of problems. So even though it's a native, you might consider some of these other native trees. Um, and I'm watching my time, so I'm gonna be a little bit shorter on my love for all of these alternatives. Um, but black gum is a wonderful alternative. That's the one here that's in a full, you can see it's full form. That comes in a variety of colors, just the straight species of black gum can be kind of from orangish to reddish and it changes um, sometimes all in the same tree really lovely tree. There are also a number of what we would call native ours. So a native tree is a biologically um, unique specimen uh, that, that would grow in the forest. So all the trees that forest relief grows are natives that we get from seed. A native R is a cultivar of a native tree, but it has, they all have the same genetics. So they can be much more predictable, which is a really great, um, option if you need a very predict predictable landscape or you have a very specific size requirement or look or feel or something. Um, but, but going with a straight species is also a really, it's a roll of the dice in some ways, but usually you come out ahead. A couple of other trees here on my list. So the spice bush, this is a spice bush from my backyard and I didn't put the fall color picture in here because what is so amazing about the spice bush beyond that it has a lovely fall color is that it is home to these amazing um, spice bush caterpillars and they are just a delight to watch. So um, again, going back to that idea of planting trees actually for insects is something that kind of changes, is a, is a, is a perspective flip that, that took me a long time to embrace. You know, usually what we're trying to do is keep all of the critters out of our landscape. When we don't, when you see something eating the leaves, you feel like, oh no, something's wrong. I need to spray for that or I need to take care of that. But the reality is if something's eating the leaves, then you are actually feeding nature in a way that, um, you know, it's like feeding your family and having everybody over for Thanksgiving dinner. Um, it's a really, it's a really neat opportunity to be able to provide for these amazing creatures in your home landscape. So spice bush is a great option. Sassafras, 
Not only does it have a lovely fall color, but it has just these really unique leaves. This is a, a I call it a double mitten. It has both a mitten, a double mitten, and a whole entire leaf all on the same tree. So whimsical and fun. You can chew on the, the leaf, uh, the petiole there. So a great tree for, for lots of reasons. Staghorn sumac, this is one that isn't really a formal species, but can be grown in mass if you have a hillside or you have areas that you want to um, maybe hold in a, in a mass. It does have just beautiful bright red fall color. And then I always want to throw in some oaks, uh, scarlet oak. We have a lot of oak trees that, that change color and we kind of forget about them because they're overshadowed by by the maples and maybe the black gums, but a lot of our oak species, including scarlet oak, will turn bright red and, and have a pretty good fall show. I wanted to throw out Asian longhorn beetle because I mentioned that as the insect that can devastate our maple population, which is a significant portion of our, especially our urban landscape. Um, but the Asian longhorn beetle also attacks all of these other trees. Ash, we've already written those guys off but birch, elm, horse, chestnut, golden rain, London plain trees and sycamores, maples, mimosas, poplars, willows. Um, so maple is by far the strongest, the, the highest risk for us in Missouri. Um, but, but this is something that, that we're watching significantly um, and trying to, to keep as far away from Missouri as possible. Right now, it's mostly a uh, Northeastern problem. So just to kind of hit this home, diversity is nature's way. This is Misty, our summer intern, modeling our, uh, our forest relief t-shirts. And we've really tried to promote diversity um, of all of our tree species with, with all of our partners. Uh, and, and I think the best way to think about it is to mix up some things. Sometimes when you Sometimes when you try a new species, it might not work. Or if you push the envelope a little bit because you want to have a mix of species, then, you know, you might, something might thrive and something else maybe meh, underperform. So experimenting is something that's, that's part of the fun of having a home garden and a landscape. And it's harder with trees because it's an investment. Like we talked about, they're there for a while. Um, but you know, mix and match and try to think about kind of sneaking some other different things in along the way. Think about those benefits. What are you going to, what's just going to scratch that itch right away? Maybe something with some pretty spring colors. That's the small tree that you're going to feel really good about for that short-term benefit. And then plant that, you know, pecan tree in the backyard that's going to eventually grow and shade, shade the, the house in the next, you know, couple of decades. Think about all, you know, mixing as many species and genera so as possible. Emphasize true natives. That's what we, true native is the, um, not a native R, and it brings with it a lot of diverse genetics. So then they mix and match and they're always, you know, it's kind of the, um, the strongest will survive mentality. And I wanted to add in here too, after I made that list, I always want to remind people to really have fun with their garden. It is such a, it's such a fun thing to go and pick out trees that are in your landscape. This is one of my pet peeves. Everyone says, I don't want a messy tree. And I have to stand up and say, there is no such thing as a not messy tree. And really some messes are really worth it. Sometimes that's where you're gonna find the most unexpected joy. And if you cut out all the messy trees from your options, you've really limited yourself. So a couple of my favorite messy trees that I would encourage you to explore, Osage Orange. Um, many of you have probably stumbled upon or juggled or played with the hedge apple fruit of an Osage Orange tree. It's a wonderful tree for curiosity. The bark is very cool. Um, Tower Grove Park has some really great specimens in the botanical garden. In the children's area, there are some um, really wonderful Osage orange trees that were actually planted by Henry Shaw. In my earlier years, I was able to do the tree assessment when they were building that um, 
Children's Museum, and we had to be very careful to protect those Osage orange trees. And that is why a lot of that area is up on stilts, is to protect the roots of those Osage orange, um, because they're just delightful, amazing trees. Pawpaw trees and persimmons. So a lot of our native fruit and nut trees can be a source for nutrients and you know food for our community. And they're also a really great way to engage trees, or <laughs> engage trees, engage kids in nature and connecting with trees. And they can pick that fruit, and they can taste that sweet, sweet persimmon, or oftentimes very, very sour persimmon. Um, they remember those moments. This is my nephew, and we went pawpaw hunting, and my daughter found a persimmon on a hike. They're just they're just really wonderful trees. And I have now both persimmons and pawpaws in my home garden. Um, and we're seeing a big um, interest in native food forests accompanying some of our urban gardens and you know, kind of more traditional orchards and so forth. And the last one that I have on this list is a catalpa tree. It is my spirit tree, so I am partial to the catalpa. But if you can think about a catalpa tree, if you have familiarity with it, it has those long monkey tails that look like some people call it a cigar tree, really big heart-shaped leaves and almost an orchid looking flower. So parts of it are really spectacular and it is a really wonderful tree, but it can be really messy when those seed pods are dropping, the flowers get mushy. So a lot of times people are like, meh, um, but I was walking in the botanical garden the other day, this is actually a picture from last year, and a whole family of owls was sitting up in that catalpa. And it reminded me that, you know, these trees are home to a lot of creature, a lot of birds that, that rely on maybe some cavities in these trees or some different things that um, we wouldn't otherwise value in our human culture. All right, is it anything native here. This is the million dollar question. When we start talking about urban forestry specifically, the urban landscape is anything but native. We ask a lot of our trees and shrubs, even in our yards, if they're not quite as challenging as this sort of concrete streetscape, much of the native aspects of that site, especially the soil, have been altered through the construction, through all kinds of you know, impacts. And so now it's not really a conducive place for native plants. It's one reason why so many of our kind of hardy exotic species, they're not, they're not invasive, that they're spreading into our native forest, but they're exotic, meaning they don't come from here. Um, a ginkgo, for example, or zelkova, crab apples, lace bark elms, these are all species that we have brought from Asia and Europe and other places, London plane tree. Um, because they can grow in these environments that we have manufactured. Um, but those are kind of the easy options and sometimes the ones that are most available, but we do have some pretty great natives that could fit the bill here. So some native trees and shrubs that are tough by nature is how I would describe them. Um, Bald cypress is a wonderful, it's a deciduous conifer. So it's this one over here with the needles. Those needles will turn a bronzy color in the fall and all fall off. So oftentimes we'll get people who are new to their landscape. They just moved or bought a new house and they'll say, oh my God, my, my pine tree is dying. What do I do? And we kind of get to the bottom of it being a deciduous tree. But it once you kind of accept that, it is a very strong tree. And even though it like many of the, these trees are adapted for floodplains. They're actually native to floodplains in Missouri because they are evolved to tolerate saturated soils with low oxygen. They can also tolerate clay and compacted soils where the limiting factor is really oxygen. So it's, it's kind of counterintuitive to think a lot of these sort of swampy type of trees are also really great for almost any challenging urban site. Um, so bald cypress is, is a wonderful option. I put sweetgum in here because I'm also very, very fond of sweetgum trees. And I imagine that maybe most of you listening are like recoiling now and all of my credibility has fallen out of favor. But sweetgum, besides the, the, the failure of that spiky little ball that everyone hates, the tree itself is magnificent. Look at that leaf. It's 
darling, a star-shaped leaf that turns all numbers of beautiful colors in the fall from purples to oranges to bright crimson red. The tree cannot be killed in the landscape. It is solid, no insect or disease problems, really just gonna thrive where it's put. Um, you know, if you have the right place for it, a sweet gum could be the right tree. Um, I also put in here river birch. River birch has this kind of peeling bark. It's a instant gratification tree in a lot of ways, tends to grow quick, um, has some really cool bark. Like it looks like a cool tree right out of the gate um, and will really bring a lot to your landscape. Um, sometimes they grow in clumps so you can get a single stem or often a clump of river, river birch. Um, Swamp white oak has started to rise in popularity and become a really sought after and common street tree, uh, park tree, really a really solid urban choice. I also challenge you to consider swamp chestnut oak as an option for just a, a really reliable white oak. They, they don't have a lot of the challenges that we're seeing with our red oak counterparts, the pin oak, for example, and the gall issues that we're seeing, the um, oak wilt challenges that are, that are associated with a lot of our northern red oaks and the bacterial leaf scorch. Those are all problems that we're seeing in our oak populations, but most of those are on the red oak side of, of the oak kind of divide. So swamp chestnut, swamp white oak are in the white oak family, and they tend to compartmentalize a little bit better and a bit stronger uh, resilient trees. Not to say that those other, red oak, those other red oak family trees are not good options for certain things, to be certain. And the last one I want to throw in there is, is a really dynamic shrub, the eastern nine bark. This tree will grow, or this, excuse me, this bush, it's a small, it's a medium-sized woody shrub. Um, it just can grow in almost any soil, and that is just a gift to an urban gardener. So it has really lovely flowers. It has really, it has kind of a peely bark, not quite as peely as the, um, the river birch here, but, but enough winter interest that, uh, that it, it holds its own in the landscape and can, can be pruned back. You can pretty much do anything to a nine bark and it'll still thrive. All right. We're going to wrap it up here and make sure we get some time for questions. I wanted to point out that the vast hardscape and lack of green infrastructure in urban areas has created urban heat islands. I imagine this is not news to most of you, but that idea that in the city, it's hotter. And the, one of the biggest transitions is lack of trees. And so we know that trees can help cool our cities and bring relief to residents. We just have to plant them and keep them, keep the mature ones growing. Um, so I wanted to just throw out a few native trees that throw serious shade. My, one of my very favorite trees is the Kentucky coffee tree. It's just a lovely large canopy tree at maturity, but it looks a little bit like an ugly duckling while it's little. So going back to that kind of nursery conundrum, it's a hard tree to sell because it never really looks good when it's small. It's sort of a stubby looking thumb. Maybe in the summer when it's fully leafed, um, you might be convinced to buy it because that leaf that you that you see in the picture here, this entire thing, and you can't see the top of it, is, a, is one leaf. It is bipinnately compound, which I and my geeky tree self think is just the coolest. But this is a compound leaflet. These are little leaflets and it's all attached to the main petiole in the middle. So cool. The Kentucky coffee tree also has this seed pod that is in itself, I think a very interesting feature, but many people would call it a messy headache and maintenance challenge. Um, the interesting thing about Kentucky coffee tree is that it is male or female. So similarly to a persimmon, there are certain trees that you, you don't know at the beginning what you're going to get, but you may get one that has no fruit and that would be a male tree. You may get one that fruits prolifically because it's a female. So sometimes with your tree selection, um, 
you you may or may not have have the fruit issue or or you may or may not have the pollen issue when we start thinking about purpose and reason some people that have severe pollen allergies might decide to get certain trees that that don't have as much pollen so those are all things that that you can weigh but unfortunately we don't have a good way to tell on the straight species if you're going to get a male or a female in the Kentucky coffee tree there are some cultivars that um, are grafted that will be that are more consistent but in its native form Kentucky coffee tree is a great shade tree all the oaks I will just say it again look up all the oaks and plant them where you can you have to have a space for them though and that is often a challenge in the home garden this is a uh, northern red oak here in the big picture that that I posted here the, the northern red oak leaf is in this section here we are experiencing in the region a big problem with our pin oak trees so there's some campaigns that are going around that are plant an oak but not a pin oak tree um, and again it gets back to that diversity challenge and let's just minimize the investment in one particular tree hackberry is another one that that grows pretty quickly it has that sort of warty bark that if you might notice uh, a little underutilized i would say in our urban landscape but can be a really solid shade option all right what's happening when things warm up speaking of urban heat island this shows the change in Missouri hardiness zones from 1990 to 2015. It's really based on 2012 data. Um, we're now hovering in the six to seven range in the St. Louis Metro for hardiness zones. Um, and we have really been having pretty good success planting trees as far south as the border for Missouri and considering them native. So since we know that trees can live a long time, it's important to think about what trees will thrive here in 30, 50, 100 years. If we're planting trees for resilient, sustainable forestry in the future, you know, all of this talk about what climate change is happening and where our climate zones are going, not just in the next 10 years, but the next 50 to 100 years, um, it, it might start to stretch our definition of native a bit. We might want to think about expanding trees and shrubs, investing in trees and shrubs that are near natives, that are close to the border, that are kind of right on the right in our with our southern neighbors to start, you know, experimenting a little bit to see if that they will be more resilient for our climate future. Um, not only are we going to have to worry about just the warmth, but also these trees are going to have to tolerate drier, warmer, drier temperatures and severe storms, more flooding and unseasonable frost. So we're going to we're going to put a lot of pressure um, on our trees here in the next little bit as we start kind of seeing what climate change is happening. All right, wait, it's 50. It's, I, it's been 50 minutes and I didn't talk about all of the other things I was supposed to talk about because I got too stuck on the tree selection and I knew that that would happen. So that's why I put this slide in here, but I think we'll be able to cover it. Um, you know, we got a great tree and we're, we're gonna plant it, but like, what, how do we do it? What's going on here? If you're new to tree planting in general, I get it. My first tree, I dug a hole to China and I planted that, I was a redbud tree actually. And I planted that thing probably five foot too deep like a tomato and poor thing did not make it. So just really quickly, some, some important planting tips as you get into your spring planting season. Um, first of all, trees can be planted in the spring, but really trees are best planted in the fall um, where they can kind of settle in and not have to fight that hot, dry summer right away. Um, but in a, in a home garden, a springtime is a great time to plant. Everyone wants to get outside and you can monitor and make sure you're watering it as needed. The big take home points for planting are don't plant the tree too deeply. There is a um, there is a point at which the trunk flares out into the roots. You want all of the trunk to be above ground and the roots to be below ground. That's kind of the rule of thumb. So where that transition happens, you want to make sure that is above the grade of the ground, and that's that's really the the money 
goal for planting trees. You want to dig the hole wider out wide. Most of the roots are going to be growing and establishing right at the surface, getting that oxygen, water, and nutrients right from the surface of the soil. So dig your hole out wide, not too deep and then keep that tree sitting right at the surface level. Stakes aren't really important. Um, backfill just with the native soil is really appropriate. Don't prune your tree too much, only kind of take out the dead, dying and diseased branches, and then let those branches make leaves that make food and starches that help grow the roots of the tree. So, you know, really just let that tree establish its root structure the, the tree will take a few years to settle in and establish into the, um, to the environment. The bigger the tree, the longer that establishment period takes. I think that's all I'm gonna give you for that. Staking is not necessarily, unless the, you're planting a really big ball and burlap tree. Most of the, all of the trees that forest relief grows are in containers. Um, and you know, again, tree planting could be its whole talk in itself, but don't plant the tree too deep dig the hole wide, those are probably the best take homes. Stewardship tips, again, taking care of trees is really just about watering them and keeping them protected in the landscape. We mulch like crazy, but we don't mulch like a volcano. We mulch like a donut. Donuts delicious, volcanoes are terrifying. So when you're mulching your tree, more is not better. You want just, you know, maybe two or three inches of mulch in a circle around the tree to keep that tree protected from lawnmower damage, keep that tree away from, um, you know, weeds and competitive turf, um, control the soil moisture some, but, but you don't want, just like we'd want the trunk to be above ground when you're planting, you want that trunk to be free of any mulch piled up on it. So pull that mulch away, make it a donut, or even just kind of flare it out so that the mulch isn't touching the trunk of the tree because that can create a lot of perfect, it's a kind of a perfect moist place for insects and diseases to occur. And then what we'll see is these very small trees, once they really start looking amazing, they get rot right at that base where the mulch is, has been kind of festering disease and they'll snap out of those big mulch volcanoes. So donuts, not volcanoes. And then trees will need to be watered for the better part of the summer, probably for the first two years. Last thing I'll say about this is that, you know, protecting trees from lawnmowers is one of the biggest challenges in our home landscape, making sure that, you know, the mowers and the weed whippers aren't chewing up the, the trunk of the tree at the base and giving it as best of a start as possible. Small acts can add up. So I encourage you to consider planting a native tree. I also offer um, that you can apply for a community tree program through Forest Relief. We offer free trees right now um, for your community planting projects. These would be for public or nonprofit locations. And then, you know, share your knowledge. A lot of home gardening um, recommendations and, and kind of the different trends are perpetuated by people talking about it. So if your neighbors all want to get together and plant native trees, you've just done a really good service. This is a little bit about forest relief. Our mission is that forest relief is, enriches communities by growing and planting trees. That's what we do. Through the power of people and partnerships, we are building a more resilient tree canopy across Missouri. We're here to help you succeed at this. So if you have more questions, you need more information, you want to um, get going with your native landscape, please reach out, check out our website. I'm happy to help direct you however you need. And with that, that is my contact information. And I apologize that we only have a few minutes for questions, but I'm happy to stay on for um, a few minutes after. Sarah, if you want to, to manage that. Can, can do. Thank you so much. That was a lot of really wonderful information. And I know folks will be appreciate um, having your contact and folks, we had some questions. We had lots of great questions so far and um, we definitely um, won't have time, probably won't have time to get through them all, but we'll try here. Um, the first thing is you talked a lot about um, diversity in, in your planting of trees. And someone brought up the 10, 20, 30 rule for tree diversity. Is that something that you would 
recommend that they and could you tell us what that what that is for those who don't know? yes so 10 20 30 is really like you're saying okay we want any we want 30 percent of any family so if you think if, if you think back to kind of how how trees are broken down family genus species is kind of the breakdown so you want you want 30 percent of any family 20 percent of any genus and only 10 percent of any given species so you only want 10% of um, pin oaks in your landscape, but maybe then 20%, no more than 20% of oaks in general, and then 30% of Quercus that are like the, the family Phagaceae, which is the family of oaks. So, so it, it, it encompasses, it's, I would say it's a rule of thumb and it's a way I we are moving towards even more restricted percentages than that. I would say the closer you can get to 10% to overall or less than that um, is really important. Um, because even if you think about 20% of maple trees, if we, if we use that rule, we say, okay, we can have 20% of maple trees in our urban landscape. And, the, and then we have the Asian longhorn beetle come through and decimate 20% of our canopy. You know, our urb, many of our urban cities in the St. Louis region only have 20% canopy cover at all. And if you take 20% of that 20%, you're really limiting yourself. So I would say it's a good rule of thumb. It's something that a lot of municipal governments use to manage their um, street tree populations in particular, because it's really hard. Those trees, you don't have as many options on a street tree population. So, so it's a good rule of thumb, but I, I would, I would say shy, get, make those smaller percentages if you can. Great, thank you so much for, for clarifying, for addressing that and clarifying that. Um, that brings me, the, the fact that you mentioned the um, the risk of, of damage from pests and other things. There were a couple of questions about, um, about damaged trees, folks who have damaged trees, but I think um, that they raised some good questions uh, that would be of general use. One was if your tree, um, if, if you have a tree that's been partially damaged and you're concerned about it, um, you know, affecting the rest of the tree eventually, is it better to, to leave it or for the ecosystem um, or should one worry about removing it? And if you have to remove it, follow-up question. Um, <laughs> someone said that they have a tree that they suspect um, it, they might have to remove because of a gall, which is, we'll get there in a second, but, um, but would it be a good idea to plant another tree nearby that's smaller so that it ha has a head start on filling that space once the other tree is removed? So okay, I'm going to try and track all these questions. Yes. But so the first repeat question if is, you if you have dam, if you have a tree that's damaged, it doesn't mean that that tree is a lost cause. So trees don't heal like, you know, we would heal our skin. But what they do is they compartmentalize and they block out a lot of the decay um, that's, that's damaging the tree and they build really sound structural wood that, that encompass it. You'll see that on a pruning wound when there's a donut shaped, you know, when you cut off a branch and it starts to seal over and creates that, that space. So inside is still a wound, but the tree itself has accommodated for that. They have evolved, you know, they can't move. They can't go to the doctor. They got to do it themselves. Um, so, so if it's damaged, it doesn't necessarily mean that that tree, you know, you're going to have to cut it down. If it's a healthy tree, it can often compartmentalize and be fine. Sometimes, depending on the amount of damage, that tree may become a high risk tree. So a high risk tree, it there's a lot of components that go into defining that and, and identifying what level of risk is acceptable for you. But it, it would be if the tree has a defect that is severe enough that it could, what if it failed, it could cause really you know, a big problem. And it's kind of likely that it will fail because the defect is so significant. So in those cases, you know, you would want to remove the tree. And I would suggest anybody that has questions about that should reach out to a certified arborist. The St. Louis Arborist Association has um, like a contact list. And that's usually where we send people um, and get somebody out and have them give you an opinion. There are certified arborists that are worth tree companies that will do that, you know, and then they'll give you a bid. And then there are other kind of consulting arborists that'll just give you a risk assessment and then you can decide for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, to the point of kind of habitat, 
that's a really interesting one. And, and it really has to do maybe with some risk. If it's in your home landscape, you want to make sure that if you have a cavity in your tree, if there's defects that you're, you're monitoring that and you know, okay, it's in the back 40 and it's fine and it's not going to be a problem. And there's a family of owls that live there that we love and we watch, like leave the tree. That's amazing. Um, if it's something that is going to cause a problem or it's going to fall in your neighbor's garage, you know, then, then you have different priorities to juggle. Um, so, so that's where I would say it's really hit or miss. And then kind of getting into the disease side of things, that's where you have a personal res responsibility. If your tree has oak wilt and your neighbor has also a red oak tree, it's your responsibility to minimize the, the, the potential for your tree's disease to spread to your other, you know? So, so sometimes it's a maintenance issue where you identify, oh, this is a, this is a problem that could spread and you want to remove the tree and, you know, remove all of the debris, sanitize that area so that you're, you're not being a problem, a nuisance to your neighbors. Um, yeah. But that, that, that's kind of rare, really, um, the disease spreading bit. Well, thank you. Thanks for, for tackling that, that tangle of, of questions. Um, and there was, there was a lot going on there, but there was a lot <laughs> overlapping here. Um, and uh so I think actually that handled the other gall question more or less in terms of we talked about diversity and uh, if people want to hear more about galls, they can um, refer back to the Doug Tallamy uh, keynote that's on it's on the YouTube channel, um, the library's YouTube channel um, about planting oaks in our area. Um, and so I want to ask about um, trying to grasp some of these uh, and pull them together. But I think there was a question about um, the shrubs that a lot of what the longer lists were about the trees that are available. And you mentioned that some of those um, plants uh, on the, the tough um, species were, um, were some shrubs there. But do you have any other recommendations for shrubs for folks? So we have a lot of, we have some like a black haw viburnum is a really great shrub. Um, I've really been impressed with the Carolina buckthorn. Um, that tree, it's a, it's a shrub mm -hmm. and it just, it looks great in our nursery. All the, like when all the other trees are just kind of like Meh, yeah. that thing, like the leaves are glossy. It's really pretty and it can be pruned, you know, shaped to fit the landscape. Um, so that's a really great one. Another one of my absolute favorite shrubs is the um, witch hazel. So witch hazel, I, I was going to put it in my slide and I didn't get a chance, but um, you know, witch hazel is a winter blooming shrub. So when everything else is just barren and ugly, the witch hazel is just popping out these really, they're kind of orchid like too, kind of weird orchidy um, flowers and they smell really good. So that's a nice one that can also grow in some shade. Um, it's a nice shade option for a native tree that has a lot of winter interest. Wonderful. Um, so also, um, speaking of recommendation, other recommendations, we had a lot of questions about evergreens. Someone, someone specifically said other than cedar, which I think is a little unfair to cedar, but, <laughs> but do, what kind of options do we have for ever, native evergreens in Missouri? We have zero, not zero, but like, like we mentioned, you mentioned, and so our Eastern red cedar, Junipers virginiana is our, you know, is a native tree. It is often, you know, there are ways in the home landscape that native are option. There are some really uh, viable native ours that are in that Eastern red cedar mindset. There's a Taylor juniper, a Canardi juniper. So again, they're not your straight species that you see on the road cuts, but um, they still do have some biological significance that that could kind of, you know, toe the line. And then our only other native evergreen is the shortleaf pine. And that tree, we are growing those in our landscape. It's a southern species, um, but it grows, it, you know, it grows in Missouri well, but it's just very difficult to find. It's hard to cultivate. Um, and so it it's just not something that we see often. So shortleaf pine would be a good alternative if you can get it. We have a few in our nursery, um, but I don't even know if we'll have them at our tree sale. Our tree sale is starting April 1st. So there's a 
there's another shameless plug. If you're interested in uh, buying a tree, you can go to our website and, uh, and find what we've got up there. Perfect. Cause we did uh, we always have questions about where folks can find, uh, tr you know, native plants. And in particular this evening, we definitely had that question about where they well, can find. And also the grow native resource guide. I'm sure others have, rec have mentioned that that will tell you all of the garden centers and anyone that has any native um, section at all. And so that's a really great place to, to start when you're looking for particular shrubs and then get on the phone and call a couple of places and make sure, you know, you don't drive out to Eureka and then realize that they don't have what you need. Yeah. Some folks did uh, mention that uh, the grow native, when you mentioned the plant, plant finder at the front as well, or at the start of things as well. Absolutely. So, yeah. And um, I know the partnership native landscaping will be having a plant sale as well. If you go to the website um, and it, um, which is shared in the resource that I'll be sending out with some of the links that you share with us, Meredith, but also other things, um, materials you can access. Um, you will be able to, to find out more about that upcoming event as well. Um, so we had some questions about um, about things that like wet soil. And I wonder if you mentioned the Eastern nine bark that that does well in a lot of soils, but someone said that they were looking for uh, actually looking for a shrub because um, sh what shrubs might work where they have a lot of water. And so is that something uh, a lot of water in the soil uh, where it kind Rub of with a lot of water? I'd have to think, you know, water tolerant trees are or trees and shrubs are a challenge. Um, there's so well, we grow a rose mallow that uh, it's not actually a tree, but it's a woody, um, it's a woody plant that has, it's a hibiscus in the hibiscus family and it has a really lovely flower. Those we often see in, um, in rainscaping projects. Um, you know, some of the, you know, I have to, I, I would say maybe email me that question if you had that question in particular. Um, the Grow Native site has some kind of top 10 species. They might have some for you. I'm thinking maybe a button bush. It kind of depends on how wet the soil is. Button bush would probably be a good one for a wet site. Um, they have really nice um, kind of whimsical flowers that look like little fuzzy buttons. Um, so that's one that I would, I would recommend, I think, for a wet site. But I would check that grow native you know, really wet soil and then and then look at is it just wet sometimes is it wet all of the time because that really will change the change the options. Great. Someone asked um, if the eld if an elderberry would be good for wet soil since we're I, on the topic. I think so. And, and again, that kind of it, especially in a home landscape, it's it's hard to to say, you know, is it wet and then well drained? Can you? But an elderberry is a really tolerant tree, uh, tolerant shrub. So my my feeling would be that it could grow um, pretty well in a in a wetter environment. Excellent. Yeah, and you mentioned rainscaping too. About you know, so we do have that uh, presentation coming up next week. So <laughs> if you have questions about uh, wetter uh, wetter terrain, I guess what are what are parts of your yard that might be a good time to. Um, Rejoin us next week for that. Um, and something else to think about when you plant large canopy shade trees, the massive amount of root structure that is established underneath, you know, in the top 18 inches of soil does an amazing job at absorbing a lot of that runoff and that sheet flow. So it might actually be that if you're planting some really large mature trees and shrubs, they might minimize that whole dynamic of kind of wet, soggy soil. Yeah, excellent point. Um, I'll check in the time. So we're kind of getting down um, to to the wire here. Um, as far as um, we could stick around after I stop the recording for for a couple more questions, if you if you're up for it, Meredith. But um, there was a good question, and that maybe this is the best best one to end on. Um, we've had a few in several several of these these presentations about. Uh, tree populations, native tree populations in particular. There have been comments about um, other like developments that uh, are affecting or um, 
not causing, but like removing a lot of trees are part of the plan and in that development. What could people do to advocate? Do you have any advice for you know neighborhoods or communities that want to advocate to keep the established trees uh, that aren't bothering anybody otherwise, and it's in the way of progress? Um, <laughs> what what might they be able to do? I love this question, and I think it. I think the answer is really to be proactive. Um, I used to do a lot with trees and construction when I was in consulting work, and the reality is. Once the bulldozers are at the doorstep, there's very little that residents can do. And, and, that, and that analogy really pushes back to once the plans are approved, once the, the process, you know, once the engineering drawing and the, the you know, cutting and filling and grading plans are already out there, um, you know, it doesn't matter how much you care about the trees at that point, because nobody, you know, we kind of took them for granted until it was like, oh, no, now they're going to be gone. Now we need to fight for them. But then at that point, you know, the system wasn't in place. So my recommendation is to join your tree boards to get in on the local level. If it's a homeowners association, or if it's at a, you know, at a city scale, so many of our cities do have tree ordinances that have, you know, some have more robust than other tree preservation, but that's a thing. Tree preservation is an ordinance kind of is in ordinance language and can be something, but you're going to be affecting those projects that are going to be dreamt up two years from now, you're going to have a hard time affecting those projects that are slated for development now. Um, so, so ordinances and getting in front of it, that's, that's the best way. If there are some issues where there's a really big conflict and some really important, valuable trees, the other thing is just having really critical conversations. There are ways that you can calculate the benefits of trees. There are ways that you can tell that story of the value and kind of justify the trees holding their own in the landscape. And maybe if a developer or a city is swayed enough, there could be some compromises. Um, but really keeping a cool head and trying to tell the story and, and really get with the right people uh, as soon as possible, the better. Wonderful. Thank you for um, sharing sharing those those thoughts. Because um, it is yeah really important. We have all these great um, established stands of trees in, in our communities, and um, and yeah, we'd like to be able to keep them where we can. I know the um, reality. The reality is, you know, with with forest relief, we're planting hope. We're planting the aspiration and the expectation that these baby trees are going to deliver that big canopy that that we all love and cherish. And if we can't protect the established forest, you know, everything that that I'm selling is kind of smoke and mirrors. So we really need to not only be planting, but also doing the hard work of keeping those trees alive. Wonderful. Perfect point to to end things on. Thank you so much for for being with us this evening. I'm going to um, stop the recording here.